Okay, we're picking up with section 5.4. There's two more sections in this chapter, 5.4 and 5.5. Um, we will finish up the chapter, but the test won't actually be until after we get back from Christmas break. Okay, and the reason for that, you'll have a quiz. The reason for that is the exam takes that one week that I can't give you a test during that week other than the exam. And so the information will still all be on the exam. And then the test is that week we get back. I think I have it that Thursday so that we'll review when we get back. We'll spend a couple days reviewing and then we'll take the test and then the 90s will end. This chapter beyond the, yes. Yeah, because we'll actually finish the chapter. We just won't get the test. We'll get the quizzes, all the quizzes in, all the material in. Yep. I'm working on the exam right now. Getting that all finalized for you guys. I was working on that up there. All right, well, section 5.4, our password problem, okay, it's modeling and optimization. You're going to be using derivatives to, to solve all of these problems, okay? When you want to optimize something, you want to find either the maximum or the minimum. Like the maximum amount of money that you can make or the minimum amount of cost that you want to spend making something. You know, so um, whenever you see an optimization problem, you're finding a max or min. And how do we find a max or min? Take the derivative. That is equal to zero. Look at the number line test, right? So we're doing the stuff that we've already learned in the chapter, just that now we're applying it to real life problems, okay? So we'll have some examples in mathematics, some in business and industry, some in economics, um, and then some with differentiable functions as well. So here we go. So strategy. There are a set of steps that you really should follow with completing these problems. First of all, read the problem so that you understand it. And I honestly write, I kind of take notes as I read the problem because I don't want to have to read it the second time. So read it carefully, identify the information you need to solve the problem. Next, develop a mathematical model of the problem. So in other words, come up with an equation that fits the problem. Sometimes it's helpful to draw pictures, label the parts that are important to the problem, introduce a variable to represent the quantity to be maximized, or minimize, and then using that variable, write a function whose extreme value gives the uh, information sought. So in other words, if they want to know the maximum radius of something, then your equation has to have a radius in there. You know, if they want to know the maximum area, then your equation has to be something with area, even though maybe they gave you something with perimeter. So sometimes there's crossover within the problems with um, different letters or variables um, that you got to kind of make sense of all the alphabet soup that you see in front of you. Number three, graph the function. Sometimes when you graph the function, you find maybe it's a negative error area or a negative radius, and you can't have those things. So you can kind of cross off pieces of information within the problem that are not important. But also, it can determine for you what values are important and like what your domain is for the problem. Number four, identify the critical points and endpoints. So here's where you're going to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. If it exists or where it fails to exist, remember, sometimes um, where there's, you know, like a corner or cuff situation. Endpoints are also very important here because you don't want to look outside of what the domain is for the problem, okay? And then solve the mathematical model. If you're unsure of the result, support or confirm your solution with another method. And so that's where, you know, like drawing the number line test and if you're looking for a maximum and it goes minus plus, then you know, oh, well, that's not the maximum, that's the minimum. You know, so, you know, making sure you use your information um, that you've already learned. And then number six, interpret the solution 
translate your mathematical result into a problem setting and decide whether the result makes sense. So sometimes you might get two answers, but one answer maybe, again, maybe doesn't make sense because it has a negative radius or a negative area or negative sign, just depending on the problem. Okay? All right. Find two numbers. So we start out kind of easy. Find two numbers whose sum is 20 and whose product is as large as possible. So this one here, we can't draw a picture. It's not one that has, you know, volume, area, anything like that. But we're looking for two numbers. Now, a lot of times in the past, if you've had a question like that, this, you've just kind of guessed and checked things. But what we want to do is we want to mathematically solve it. Okay? We know we have two numbers, right? So let's let the first number be x. If their sum is 20, that means the two numbers add up to 20, right? So that means my second number is 20 minus whatever the first number is. And whose product is as large as possible. The word large here is asking me for a maximum. Product means what? Multiply. So let's take these and multiply them together. X times 20 minus X. This is my model that I'm coming up with. Or I could distribute the X and I could get 20X minus X squared. So that when I go to take the derivative, I don't have to use the product rule then, right? If I keep it as that first line, I've got to use the product rule to find the derivative. So this here is a parabola that opens down. Does that have a maximum to it? Yeah. So it's kind of coming together here. So now just take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So f prime of x equals 20 minus 2x. And as I set that equal to 0, I get 20 equals 2x. Divide both sides by 2. x is 10. So then I go back over here and I say, well, x is 10. 20 minus x is also 10. So two numbers whose sum is 20, 10 plus 10 is 20, and whose product is as large as possible, the product would be 100 right there. So for this, our two numbers are 10 and 10. It didn't say they had to be different numbers. Right? Two numbers that have that information. So this one here lacks the fact that I can draw a graph or, you know, anything with it. I, it kind of, you know, a couple of the steps get taken out because there's not a picture that goes with it. Okay. You can see the idea of reading it, coming up with, you know, your variables, your, your model. This is your model, your mathematical model, taking the derivative, setting it equal to zero. That's pretty much what you're going to do on every problem. Okay, next, fabricating a box. An open top box is to be made by cutting congruent squares of side length x from the corners of a 20 by 25 inch sheet of tin. So if I'm going to cut out these corners like this that are x by x, you certainly have seen problems like this before, but you haven't done calculus with them. Then I'm going to fold it on these dotted parts right here so that I end up with a box that looks kind of like that. Get the idea, hopefully. What is this dotted part from here to here? What is that length right in there? Yeah, Michael. 20 minus 2x, right. Because the entire side from here to here is 20. 
and you've taken off an x here and an x here, so 20 minus 2x. So I'm going to let that be this front side right there. Okay. Well, then how about this side here? What's that blue part right there going to be? Good. And then my final question is, what is this part right here? Yeah. X, right. Because as these things fold up, we end up getting the height of that as it folds up. Does everybody understand the picture? So we've read the problem. We haven't even finished reading the problem. How large should the squares be to make the box hold as much as possible? So we want the maximum, and they're hold as much as possible. That's the maximum volume. So it's not the maximum x length. It's the maximum volume. And what is the resulting maximum volume? So we're defining x, and then also what that volume would be. Okay. So anybody remember the formula for the volume of a rectangular solid like this from geometry? How do I find the volume? Base times width times height, length times width times height, whichever you call it. Yep. x times 20 minus 2x times 25 minus 2x. Now, I just got done teaching this here to my pre-calc class that I teach over at Penn. And in their class, we didn't multiply it all out because they don't know calculus yet. So in your past, you didn't have to multiply it out. In this class, we're going to have to find the derivative. Do you know how to take the derivative of a product rule with three things? No, so we have to multiply it out. Okay. So for this right here, our next step would be multiplying it out. I'd start with these two and then in the very last step, multiply that x through. So I'm just foiling these. 20 times 25. 500. And then outside is minus 40x and inside is minus 50x. Those are like terms that combine together to give me minus 90x. And then last is plus 4x squared. Now from here, distribute that x. So volume equals 500x minus 90x squared plus 4x cubed. From here, find the derivative. So I get the derivative of 500x is 500, derivative of 90x squared is minus 180x, derivative of 4x cubed is plus 12x squared. Some of you prefer to have this as 12x squared uh, minus 180x plus 500 as well. And then we set this equal to zero. Now, if you can get it to factor, if it factors, it's on the non-calculator portion of the test. If it doesn't factor, then it's on the calculator portion of the test. Okay. So let me cheat and look here. I think it's on the, yeah, it's on the calculator portion of the test for this one here. So for this right here, you would graph it and just find the x-intercept. Otherwise, you'd factor it to set it equal to zero. Okay. All right, so going to my calculator to graph it. Let's see, y equals some of this stuff. 12x squared minus 180x plus 500. I'm going to start at zoom standard, which is, um, you know, zoom 6 just because I don't know where I was at before. And then I'm going to mess around from there with my window. Like this is where it crosses the y-axis, right? This happens to be a parabola that opens up. 
all I care about is where it hits the x-axis. You know, that's the only thing I care about on this. This isn't the original. This is the derivative. Okay. As I look at it on my calculator screen, from where it's at, I can see this. That's all I can see. So let's think about it. Because you don't want to waste a lot of time on your calculator if you don't need to. Where's the rest of this parabola? Coming back down like somewhere over here. Right? Can I have a negative x value in this problem? So do I even care about that? Not at all. The only thing I care about is this, which means my zoom 6 is perfectly fine for this problem. Now, had it gone this side, I would have needed this side as well. You know, so you got to just kind of, you know, take and weigh it out, like what makes sense in the problem. All right, from here I'm going to go to calculate 0, pick maybe 3 and 5 that are on the left and right of it. And this value is 3.6811869. That's the x value right there. Now, remember, this here is v prime. So I could look at my first derivative number line as well. Isn't it above the x-axis on this side and below the x-axis on this side? Is this showing that it's a maximum? Plus minus means a maximum. Like I can check these things as well. Generally, if you have two answers, that's really the only time. You'd have to check to see which one's the max and which one's the min. But um, they're not going to try to trick you. Okay, They're not trying to trick you at all. All right, so for this, my x cutout would be 3.681 inches in order to maximize this. But then it asks the question, not only what is the x value, but also what is the resulting maximum volume of the box? Okay, This answer that I have in my calculator is, the, is in the brains of my calculator in the memory right now. It's the very last thing I did. Okay, So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go onto my regular screen and just press enter and it's going to bring that answer to my regular screen. So when I just go to quit and I just press enter, oh sorry, second answer I have to do and then enter. Calculate. I pressed something else on my regular screen that kind of wiped it out there. Okay, going back to this. I'm going back to um, finding that zero again so that it's in my calculator. Three and five. Enter. Okay. Now I'm going to my regular screen. Second answer. Now it's there. Okay. I had pressed something else in between so it like wipes it out instantly. So now what I'm going to do is I can either go to this and every time there's an X I can just put second answer or I can go to this. So you have your options. Any of these three right here, you're going to go to your regular screen and you're going to put your X value in. So I don't know. I'll probably just go to this one. It looks like fewer keystrokes. 500 times second answer. And then minus 90 times second answer squared and plus 4 times second answer to the third. And so the volume that came out of that is 820.528 inches cubed. What you do not want to do is you do not want to use 3.681. It's rounded, and it's not going to give you the proper decimal places here. AP is going to grade three decimal places. Okay, so you got to make sure that those three decimal places are correct. And how you do that is you don't ever use a rounded answer. So that answer was, that 3.681 was fine for this answer, but it was not fine in finding.
Okay, any questions on that? Is it negative? No. Oh, oh, into the original. So you can't have a 20. Why would you plug 25 in? Right, so this original equation right here, your original is a cubic. So it goes down, it comes back up. Your original equation does. So what happens, here, let's talk about this original equation. If it's in this form right here, it equals 0 at x equals 0, x equals 10, and x equals 12.5. So it's crossing the x-axis at 0, at 10, and at 12.5. It's a cubic. It's coming up like this, down like this, up like this. Okay? The only part of this problem that's usable, that makes sense, is this part right here. If you plug in 25, then you're saying the x cutout is 25. Can this be 25 if that side is 25? Okay, so yes, it's giving you an answer, but it's not an answer that makes sense in the problem. It's not a logical answer, right? Okay, so any answers that would make sense are any x values between 0 and 10. Here's why the 10. This side right here, half of it is 10. If you had an x value come over to here and over to here, you'd have a volume of 0, right? That's why the volume right there would be zero. Like, just to kind of make sense of that picture right there. So the only parts that make sense are anything between zero and 10. Because here it's going to give you, between 10 and 12.5, it's going to give you a negative volume. We can't have a negative volume. Over here is where yours was. It was right over here giving us kind of baked information. Because if you have a side length that's 25, you can't have one of your x values be 25. Then where's your other x value? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Good question, because that made me put this up here for you guys to see. And so when I mentioned about my pre-calc class that I, you know, had taught this problem to, why is this thing not moving? I've lost my touch sense here. Um, this is what they did with it then. They graphed it right here to look at what the domain was that made sense in the problem, which was from zero. Okay? All right. Give me a second. Changed over there, but it did not change over here. Okay, good, good, good. All right, so next, designing a can. And this is one that's more calculus based, um, that AP would be more apt to use. Okay, they're probably not going to use the one with the corners. That's just kind of getting you used to talking about the domain and stuff. You've been asked to design a one liter oil can shaped like a right circular cylinder. What dimensions will use the least amount of material? This time it's asking for a minimum. Okay. Now, one liter is how many cubic centimeters? Anybody know? Exactly. And you are expected to know that. One liter equals 1,000 cubic centimeters. So what would two liters be? 
how many cubic centimeters? 2,000. 3 liters, 3,000. 5 liters, 5,000. Those are the common ones that you'll see. Okay? Make sure you know that. Okay. Now, they've mentioned a couple of things here. They've mentioned this 1,000 cubic centimeters. That is a volume that is mentioned. And do you remember the formula for the volume of a right circular cylinder? Anybody remember that? It has this base that is a circle that has a radius, right? And it has a height, which is H. It's the area of the base times the height. So the area of the base is pi r squared times the height. And here's where we start getting into the alphabet soup where we have all kinds of different letters involved. Right now, you could substitute this 1,000 into the volume. But you don't know whether to solve this for R or to solve it for H. Sometimes you want to solve it for R and sometimes you want to solve it for H, just depending on the other information that's given in the problem. Okay, now let's keep reading. What dimensions will use the least amount of material? That's not talking about volume. Volume is talking about making the container. It's talking about the surface area. So this is the minimum surface area is the question, not the minimum volume. And that's where you've got to really kind of keep it separated as you read these problems. So now let's take apart this container right here, right? We would need a top and a bottom. And then how about that outside? Just place it down the middle and open it up. You've got yourself a rectangle. So, okay, do I have a piece of paper here? You have a cylinder that looks like so. You slice it and open it up. And it gives you your rectangle. And then you have a circle on the top and the bottom. Make sense? Hold that. Okay, so now think about the measurement. This here has a radius of R. This has a radius of R. And to find the surface area, I would need the area of that. The area of each is pi R squared. I have two of those. So I have two pi R squared. I'm building a formula for surface area. Plus then I have this rectangle. Which the rectangle is the, the length times the width, or the base times the height, which the height is H, but what is this? 2 pi r is correct. And again, let me just kind of show you. It was here. When it opened up, it's the circumference of that circle. You see why geometry, taking geometry, comes before this class? Because you need to understand those things. Okay? So the area of this right here, then, is 2 pi r h. Okay. I want to be able to take the derivative of this, set it equal to 0 to find the minimum of the surface area, but I cannot have two different letters in here. The easiest one to replace would be the h. So let's come over here and get h by itself by dividing both sides by pi r squared. So h equals 1,000 divided by pi r squared, which I'm then going to take and substitute in. So before you have any calculus, you have this prep work. 
And believe it or not, you've done some of this prep work in other courses leading up to it. So all I'm doing is I'm replacing the H with the 1,000 over pi r squared, but I do have to simplify this. So surface area equals 2 pi r squared plus 2,000 over r. The pi reduces and one of the r's reduce. You do not want to take the derivative in this form or you've got a product rule going on right there. Instead, your best bet is simplifying anything you can. In fact, I'm going to take it one more step and pull that R up so that it's ready for me to take the derivative. That way I can just use the power chain rule with it. Maybe. There we go. Okay, so here we go. Now we're left to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. We're at the calculus part. So, surface area prime, I could say, or I could say the derivative of surface area with respect to R, since it's not an X over on that side, it's an R. So over here, the derivative of 2 pi R squared, what do you suppose that is? Uh-huh, perfect, 4 pi R. And then the derivative of 2,000 R to the negative first, And then we're going to set it equal to 0. 4 pi r minus 2,000 over r squared. I'm going to put that back. It's going to make my algebra a little bit easier then from here down. I can move that negative term to the other side. 4 pi r equals 2,000 over r squared. Next, multiply both sides by r squared. I get 4 pi r cubed equals 2,000. Divide both sides by 4 pi. I get r cubed equals 500 over pi. And then take the cube root of both sides. So r equals the cube root of 500 over pi. Remember when it's an odd root, you don't need a plus or minus. If it was an even root, you need the plus or minus, but think about it. Could you have a negative r in this situation? So again, you know, you don't you wouldn't even need the negative there. Okay. So this here is the r value. This is an exact answer. If they asked you, you know, if they said if it was on a calculator section, then they would expect you to take 500 divided by pi and take it to the one-third power or the cube root, which is 5.419. But I would have to label. So that's where you got to go back up. Remember it was cubic inches or cubic centimeters, I mean? cubic centimeters, so that means this radius is going to be centimeters. So it just depends. If it's if it's on the non-calculator, you're going to leave your answer like this. If it's on the calculator section, you're going to leave it like this. Now that gives us R. Did they ask us for anything else? We've always got to go back because sometimes then they want to know what the actual um, you know surface area is, what the maximum volume would be what the H would be up in the problem. You know, they can ask us all different questions here. So we already know the volume was one liter, 1,000 cubic centimeters. So what dimensions, oh, well, that's plural right there now, isn't it? So that means I have to give not only the radius, but I have to give the height. So go back up. You see that height over there on the left side? You're going to take your answer and plug it into that. So h equals 1,000 divided by pi times the cube root of 500 over pi. 
e root of 500 over pi squared. Okay. Now, does this simplify? Does it reduce? You know, of course, if it's calculator, you could just pop it in with second answer right there, second answer squared when you do it. I would highly suggest using second answer on that. Um, but this right here, I'm sure these pies would definitely take and reduce. So let me kind of just show you quick. This means pi, this here is like to the two-thirds power. 500 to the two-thirds power and pi to the two-thirds power. And so if you have pi to the first and pi to the two-thirds, doesn't that give you pi to the one-thirds power? So this would be 1,000 pi to the one-third 500 to the two-thirds power. So you could kind of leave it like that. You could say the cube root of pi and the cube root of 500 squared or the cube root of 25 with four zeros, so 250,000. Okay. Of course, that would be in centimeters as well. But that's if you don't have a calculator, that's how you do it. I think that's a good place to stop for today. Um, this here has both days on it, but this one here is um, one problem. And then after that you have, so tonight you should do just these problems. One, five, nine, 12, and 17. Let me just double check and make sure that that one is not on there. Yeah, we're going to have to move this one down to tomorrow. Because number one is just like this last problem. Okay. All right, so 5, 9, 12, and 17. You have four pro or three, four problems there. Um, number 17 is just like the last one we just did. Um, the others, I mean, there's no two problems that are alike. That's the problem. So use the skills that we talked about, drawing out your pictures with them. And we definitely can go over some of them tomorrow as well. Okay, and then tomorrow we'll finish this one up, go over questions from the four that you had for homework, and then from there, any other extra time you'll work on homework tomorrow. Okay? So section 5.4, optimization.